Hello, my name is Zach Davis, and for my capstone project, I did an investigation of trace elements in South Dakota prairie barren soils. Let's begin with an introduction to prairie barrens. Prairie barrens are grassland habitats characterized by sparse but not completely absent vegetation, the presence of exposed parent material, which is the underlying rock from which soil is formed. Prairie barrens tend to have extreme soil properties, which makes it hard for plants to grow, such as being very sandy or clay rich, being very acidic or alkaline, being very extremely salty, or having high concentrations of toxic elements. This combination of extreme properties means a lot of plants we would normally find in prairies aren't able to grow in barrens, but there are some plants that prefer to grow in these regions. We call such plants indicator species. Indicator plants are diverse, ranging from legumes to mustards, but they all prefer soils with extreme properties, and they all accumulate high concentrations of toxic elements in their tissues, which I will come back to later. Now that we've answered the question of what are prairie barrens, we should also answer the question of why are prairie barrens? During the mid to late Cretaceous from around 90 to 55 million years ago, the Black Hills and much of the rest of North America was covered by the Western Interior Seaway. Ocean sediments were compacted into shale and limestone formations, which were rich in trace elements. The Laramide uplifting event that created the Rockies caused the seaway to recede, pushing the ocean sediment formations up to the surface. Once the Western Interior Seaway receded about 55 million years ago, ocean sediment formations were eroded into the soils we see today. So why do we care about prairie barrens? Prairie barren soils have concentrations of toxic elements that are several orders of magnitude greater than the surrounding prairies. Prairie barrens are scattered across Western South Dakota, forming hot spots of toxic elements which leach into the water supply and are also taken up by plants. These areas are used by humans for recreation and for grazing livestock and exposure to toxic elements by drinking contaminated water or by eating contaminated plants can cause adverse health effects. Now there are three main questions this project aims to answer. Firstly, what plants occur on South Dakota's prairie barrens and surrounding grassland habitats? Secondly, what are the physical and chemical properties of prairie barren soils relative to surrounding grassland habitats? Thirdly, how are compositions of plant communities in these habitats related to soil traits and other parameters like geology and climate? Because my role in the project was more chemistry oriented, this presentation will focus on answering question two, quantifying the characteristics of soils in prairie barrens and determining how they compare to the characteristics of soils in the surrounding prairies. Now for research methods. This is a map of the study sites. The large green area in the center is the Black Hills proper and the small green area just northwest of it is the Bear Lodge Mountains of Northeast Wyoming. We have study sites located to the north of the Black Hills from Belfouche to Buffalo, as well as to the south south near Edgemont. As so you've got some pictures surrounding the map as well, which you can see here. We collected soil samples from both barren sites as well as surrounding grasslands. This here is a zoomed in version of the map on the previous slide. The dark green area is Black Hills National Forest. This map shows the 11 focal sites, all barrens, that were studied more extensively than the other sites. I will get back to them later. On my first day of field work, we got caught in a thunderstorm and had to take shelter in a very muddy canyon. That's me in the red raincoat at the approximate moment when I realized I was not cut out to be a field biologist. Fortunately, the other field days went more smoothly than the first. We spent the better part of the summers of 2019 and 2020 collecting soil samples 
measuring the amount of bare ground at each site, and taking inventories of plants found at each site. The picture in the bottom is of a soil sample taken from one of the sites. A total of about 200 samples were collected from 50 sites. Once we had the soil, we had to process it by crushing it down and removing debris. This was done with a mortar and pestle, which took up much of the rest of the summer of 2019. The upper left is grad, in the upper left is grad student Anthony Checky, who is working on this project as part of his own master's thesis. And across the bottom are two of my other student colleagues from this project, and that's me there in the middle. We digested the samples in acid to pull elements out of the soil and into solution, allowing them to be quantified. Credit for the digestions goes to my undergraduate colleagues in the Ramsey lab who digested in the crushed samples while other students, including me, were crushing the other samples for them. Under supervision by Dr. Dan Asunskis, we then measured elemental concentrations in the samples using flame atomic absorption spectroscopy, which is basically a fancy way of saying we lit the sample on fire and looked at the color of the flame. Each element burns with a unique color, and the intensity of that color tells us how much of that element is present in the sample. We also used mass spectrometry to detect and quantify metal ions in the samples. All of this work, the collection, processing, and analysis, all had to be done very quickly because many of the elements we were looking for are volatile, which made it especially frustrating when the absolute dinosaur of a computer running the instruments decided to cancel its lease on life. We also examined other soil traits, including pH, electrical conductivity, which represents uh, salinity of the soil, and soil texture. That's fellow undergrad Nate de la Montaña analyzing samples for soil texture, which is done by mixing the soil sample in water and measuring how long it takes for everything to settle to the bottom. Moving on to the results. This chart shows the results of our bare ground survey with each dot representing a site. The normal prairie sites indicated by the green circle have very little bare ground. And as expected, the barren sites tended to have much more bare ground than normal prairies. So for the elements, we, the elements we analyzed can be labeled as either trace elements like arsenic, selenium, cadmium, nickel, and thallium, which in normal soils are present in only very small amounts, or nutrients like potassium, iron, magnesium, and calcium, which are usually orders of magnitude more abundant. Large concentrations of nutrients are essential for plant health while even moderate concentrations of trace elements are usually harmful. It is worth noting that some trace elements are actually beneficial in very small amounts. In this chart, each black dot represents the average concentration of an element found at a site, and the x-axis represents concentration in parts per million. So let's begin with arsenic, which we all recognize as a poison. It works by disrupting cellular respiration, starving cells for energy. It has both acute and chronic effects, which means it will kill you now and later. For arsenic levels in soils, anything above about five parts per million is considered abnormally high. Most of the sites represented by the green box had low mean values, but as you can see, some of the sites had extremely high values. You'll see a similar pattern with the other elements. Selenium kind of blurs the line between toxic trace element and nutrient because it's required in very small amounts for animals in the synthesis of some proteins. And some of the indicator plant species we studied accumulate it in their tissues to keep things from eating them, 
but it is very toxic in even moderate amounts. Here in South Dakota, selenium concentrations above about one or two parts per million are considered abnormally high. Signs and symptoms of selenium poisoning uh, called selenosis and colloquially called alkali disease or blind staggers include causing one's breath to smell like garlic, uh, causing hair and nails or hooves, if you're an ungulate, to fall out as well as nastier stuff like muscle weakness, respiratory distress, neurological problems, and immune system damage, which can ultimately be fatal if selenium intake isn't reduced. Now, while small amounts of selenium can be beneficial, there is no amount of cadmium that can be tolerated by any living organism. Readily taken up by cells, even tiny amounts catalyze uncontrolled generation of highly reactive hydrogen peroxide that rips apart DNA. Cadmium is one of the most potent carcinogens known to man or plant. And kind of like selenium, uh, nickel is poisonous in moderate amounts causing chlorosis and oxidative stress in plants and cancer in animals, but plants need it in small amounts to facilitate nitrogen fixation. Like arsenic, thallium is one of the heavy hitters on this list. Sure, selenium, cadmium, and nickel will cause a lot of damage over time, but thallium will just straight up kill you. It made an even better murder weapon than arsenic because it takes less of it to cause similar symptoms, i.e. death, but doesn't have a distinctive taste or smell like arsenic does. It also disrupts photosynthesis in plants. Now, putting all of these together, as you can see, the trace elements all follow a very similar trend. The averages across all the sites are low, but there are some very high values. As expected, the sparseness of vegetation at a site correlates with higher concentrations of trace elements. The results shown here include all sites, both barrens and surrounding grasslands. Now let's take a closer look at the Focal 11 barren sites that I mentioned earlier. The following plots show samples collected from only the Focal 11 sites, color-coded by site, as you can see compared to the map I used earlier here. Each color represents a unique site, and each point is an individual sample taken from a site. Looking at arsenic again, you can see that all the barren sites are not the same. Among the Focal 11, arsenic values ranged from very low to extremely high. This more detailed plot shows that elemental concentrations can vary within an individual site. Also, just because one site has high levels of one element doesn't mean it has high levels of other elements as well. Uh, focus on the plot at the bottom represented by the orange circles. It has high levels of arsenic, but low levels of selenium, although those selenium levels are still higher than normal prairie habitats, and sort of moderately high amounts of nickel. So what this means is that the Focal 11 barren sites have much higher elemental concentrations than the surrounding prairies, but not all in the same way. Now we're moving on to nutrients. We have potassium, which is involved in protein synthesis and cellular signaling in both animals and plants. Unlike the trace elements, concentrations of potassium are much more widely distributed, even in normal prairie sites. And this trend holds with the other nutrients as well. Iron, which in animals carries oxygen through the bloodstream and is vital for synthesis of chlorophyll in plants. Again, you can see it follows the same trend as potassium with concentrations being pretty widely distributed. 
Magnesium, which facilitates energy production in cells, nucleic acid synthesis, and is a critical component of chlorophyll, shown on the right here, forming a chelate with a critical magnesium ion. And finally, calcium, which is an important intracellular signaling ion in all organisms, as well as a critical component of bones and shells in animals. Note that because South Dakota soils are derived mainly from limestone and other calcium rich minerals, the soil samples were as much as 20% calcium, which is extremely high relative to the other, other elements we tested for, but this was to be expected. So again, unlike the trace elements, the nutrients are not only orders of magnitude more abundant, but also more widely distributed with concentrations varying greatly in both prairie habitats and in barren habitats. So what does this all mean? When it comes to soils, prairie barrens are distinct from surrounding grasslands. They have abnormally high levels of trace elements, but not all barrens have high levels of the same elements relative to each other. They also have much more sparse vegetation. Furthermore, the percentage of bare ground found at a site strongly correlates with concentrations of trace elements. This means that sparseness of vegetation is a reliable indicator of abnormally high levels of trace elements in soil. Now, this project has been a huge undertaking and I never could have done it alone. I've had help from many more people than just my mentors, Justin and Tara Ramsey, all of whom I greatly appreciate, including the rest of the Ramsey lab, including faculty and fellow students. I should also acknowledge South Dakota Board of Regents and South Dakota Bryn for funding this project. I'd especially like to thank grad student Anthony Checky for letting me be a part of his project and for dragging me all over the Black Hills in inclement weather. And thank you for listening to me ramble for the past few minutes. <laughs>